Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Monday, August the 3rd. Today is the day in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod where we commemorate the lives of Joanna, Mary, and Salome who brought the herbs and uh, embalming, and embalming of preservation herbs along to bring to the grave of Jesus. Uh, very, very expensive stuff. And the uh, the interesting thing about they being the first encounter with the resurrected Christ and the first to see the empty tomb, you can imagine how confused they were, you know, because they never really followed Christ's teaching or the way he was explaining it, but they will soon. They will soon. Uh, well, with that, let's begin. My throat goes out. <clears throat> Man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father. Heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life. The universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. <laughs> the slide's out of order. No wonder it was goofy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured rain before God, the one of Sinai. Before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a willing dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Sorry, my voice was getting cracky. Mm. Okay, so our New Testament reading tonight is from Acts chapter 27. Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because even the... Because even the... Doesn't make sense. Okay, go over it. That doesn't make sense to me. We'll pick it up in verse 13. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when... And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave away to it as if it were driven along. Running under the, I the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergrade the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered their gear, 
and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo, and on the final day they knew they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you, take heart, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night stood there before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you with all those who sail with you. So to take heart, men, for I, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run around again on some island. <clears throat> Man, sorry. Uh, okay, Augsburg Confession. Okay, Article 27 on Monastic Vows. It will be easier to understand what we teach about monastic vows by considering the state of the monasteries and how many things were done every day contrary to canon law. In Augustine's time, there were free associations. Later, when disciples was corrupted, dis dis discipline was corrupted, vows were added for the purpose of restoring discipline, as in a carefully plan planned prison. Gradually, many other regulations were added beside vows. These binding rules were laid upon many before the lawful age, contrary to canon law. Many entered monastic life through ignorance. They were not able to judge their own strength, though they were old enough. They were trapped and compelled to remain, even though some could have been freed by the kind of provision of canon law. This was more in the case of converts of women than of monks, although more consideration should have been shown the weaker sex. This rigor displeased many good people, because before this time, who saw the, the young man and women were thrown into convents for living, they saw what unfortunate results came of the procedure, how it created scandals, and what snares were cast upon consciences. They were sad that the authority of canon law in so great a matter was utterly set aside and despised. In addition to all these evil things, a vow of vows was added that displeased even the more considerate monks. They taught that monastic vows were equal to baptism. They taught that a monastic life merited forgiveness of sins and justification before God. Yes, they even added that the monastic life not only merited righteousness before God, but even greater merit, since it was said that the monastic life not only kept God's basic law, but also the so-called evangelical consuls. So they made people believe in that the profession of monasticism was far better than baptism, and that the monastic life was more meritorious than that of rulers, pastors, and others, who serve in their calling according to God's commands without any man-made services. None of these things can be denied. This is all found in their own books about monasticism. Now, how did all this come about in monasteries? At one time, they were schools of theology and other branches of learning, producing pastors and bishops for the benefit of the church. Now it is another thing. It's needless to go over what everyone knows. Before they came together for the sake of learning, now they claim that monasticism is a lifestyle instituted to merit grace and righteousness. They even preach that it is a state of perfection. They put monasticism far above all other kinds of life ordained by God. We have mentioned all these things without hateful exaggeration, so that our teacher's doctrine of monasticism may be better understood. 
First, concerning monks who marry, our teachers say that it is lawful for anyone who is not suited for the single life to enter into marriage. Monastic vows cannot deny what God has commanded and ordained. God's commandment is this, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. It is not just a command given by God. God has created and ordained marriage for those who are not given an exception to the natural order by God's work. This is what is taught according to the text in Genesis 2.18. It is not good that the man should be alone. Therefore, those who obey this command and ordinance of God do not sin. What objection can be raised to this? Let people praise the obligation of a monastic vow as much as they want, but they will never be able to destroy God's commandment by means of a monastic vow. Canon law teaches that superiors can make exceptions to mon monastic vows. How much less are such monastic vows in force that are contrary to God's commandments? In fact, an obligation to a monastic vow could never be changed for any reason. The Roman popes could never have granted exceptions to the vows, for it is not lawful for someone to make an exception to what is truly from God. The Roman pontiffs have wisely judged that mercy is to be observed of these monastic obligations. And you know what? We're going to come back and do more of this another day. And even this one article is too long to do in one session. So be on the lookout for that. Tomorrow evening. Um, right. We go about Joanna, Mary, and Salome. Known in some traditions as the faithful women, the visit of these three persons and other women to the tomb of Jesus on the first Easter morning is noted in the Gospel records. Joanna was the wife of Chusa, a steward in Herod's household. Mary, the mother of James, the son of Alphaeus, was another of these women who faithfully provided care for Jesus and his disciples from the time of his Galilean ministry through his burial after the crucifixion. Salome, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, joined with the women both at the cross and in bringing the spices to the garden tomb. These faithful women have been honored in the church through the centuries as examples of humble and devoted service to the Lord. Now we confess the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures. And so, I don't, what creed am I doing? Sorry about that. Ow. I was just mixing in part of the Nicene Creed. Huh. All right. Maybe I'll take it too. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. No. Really? Yeah, so let's just end that part. I don't know. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Mighty God, your crucified and buried Son, do not remain in the tomb for long. Give us joy in the tasks set before us, that we might carry out faithful acts of service, as did Joanna, Mary, and Salome, offering to you the sweet perfume of our grateful hearts, so that we too may see the glory of your resurrection and proclaim the good news with unrestrained eagerness and fervor worked in us through our Lord Jesus Christ who rose and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.